We are just going to keep going with the low cost fabrication process. So in the last video, we stopped at um, creating the, uh, the, the distinction between field oxide and thin oxide. We grew field oxide in areas that were not exposed, that were exposed actually through the active mask and thin oxide in areas that were not exposed. Now we remove the active mask and we use the third mask, which is called the poly mask or the polysilicon mask. And uh, this mask basically defines areas where we will have transistor gates and wiring in between transistor gates. Specifically, it defines areas where, where we will grow polysilicon on top of the wafer, but practically it defines areas with transistor gates. So uh, we begin by using chemical vapor deposition, CVD, to deposit a, a rather thick layer of polysilicon on top of the entire wafer. So the red here is polysilicon. Uh, the question is, why are we de de depositing polysilicon? Why not de deposit single crystal silicon? Because the kind of temperature we need to form single crystal silicon will not allow us to keep the wafer intact. And we have already created features on the wafer. Uh, specifically, uh, we, have, we have already diffused the well. So we deposit polysilicon because that's the best we can do. This polysilicon is heavily doped so that its conductivity is high and it will be used to make transistor gates. There's a question we have to keep in mind, which is why are we using polysilicon to make MOSFET gates? Why not use metal to make MOSFET gates? In any way, uh, the polysilicon we will deposit will be uneven, even though CVD is a process that uh, yields even films. The reason for the unevenness, for the uh, irregularity, is um, because of the underlying uh, silicon dioxide. Uh, there's a difference between the thickness of field oxide and thin oxide, and thus the polysilicon will reflect this. And so we have to use chemical mechanical polishing to completely polish the surface of the polysilicon. If we don't do this, then when we use etching to pattern the polysilicon, it will not give us accurate results because it will take longer to etch the thicker parts and shorter to, to etch the uh, thinner parts. But more importantly, if we don't planarize the polysilicon at this point, then the irregularity will build up in higher layers and we will end up with uh, faults or defects at the higher layers uh, in the form of uh, unplanned opens or unplanned shorts. In any case, we end up with a uh, well planarized uh, layer of polysilicon. We then apply uh, the photoresist and uh, expose it and develop it. Obviously, we are only leaving a small part of the photoresist on the top of the wafer while we have developed away most of the, uh, most of the rest. We then use a specific etchant, a wet etchant, that eats away at silicon, at polysilicon, but not at silicon dioxide. And this will etch away all of the polysilicon except for areas that are covered with photoresist, which will be protected by the photoresist. This might seem like um, a bit of a waste because we are depositing a, a lot of material only to uh, uh, keep just a little bit of it, but that's the only option we have. Um, in any case, what you see here, these red parts will be the MOSFET gates. Uh, you can see them above the oxide, and so this is the metal, and this is the oxide, this is the metal, and this is the oxide, and this is the semiconductor, and this is the semiconductor. We have created the MOS capacitor. Um, of course, the polysilicon gate now looks a little bit thicker than we are used to when we draw like illustrative uh, diagrams of MOSFETs, but um, this is what it is. So we remove the poly mask and we apply the next mask. Obviously, uh, what we need to do next is to implant the sources and the drains of the MOSFETs. And so the next mask is actually called the P plus select mask. And the P plus select mask will indicate areas where we want to implant uh, acceptors so that we create P plus areas. And so 
first of all, we will cover the whole thing in uh, photoresist, try as much as possible to establish um, a, a regular film of photoresist. We will expose and develop the photoresist, and then we will have this pattern opened through the photoresist. Now, um, the P plus mask is going to indicate areas where we want to implant uh, acceptors. And so we're going to expose the wafer this way to the iron gun and we are going to do iron implantation. Uh, so what's going to stop, um, what's going to stop iron implantation from taking place in areas um, which are not exposed? The fact that there is photoresist. So basically we have photoresist in areas that are not exposed. This is going to protect the wafer from implantation in these areas. And we have areas that are exposed that will have an implant of uh, P+. Plus. You can notice that we have areas within the N well which will have uh, P plus implants. And these areas are going to form the sources and the drains of the P muscles. And we have an area outside or more, one or more areas outside in the substrate. These will form the contact to ground for the substrate. Notice that the P plus mask does not have to be uh, very precise. It doesn't really draw uh, exactly over the areas that we want to implant into. But what it does is that it indicates the areas where we actually, um, it, all it has to do is it has to include the areas where we want to implant. Because it's not going to be able to implant in areas where there is a thick oxide. Right. So if you draw it a little bit larger than you need to, that's okay. But you cannot draw it any smaller than you need to. And so if you go back to the active mask, we, what we have to do is we have to draw a P plus select mask that includes the uh, PMOS transistors and the contact to ground. As long as it includes them, that's fine because the, the photoresist and uh, and the and the and the uh, and the field oxide will take care of not allowing implants to seep through to areas which were not intended. Notice also that the polysilicon gate is not allowing um, ions to implant through it, and so it protects the area under it. This allows it to form uh, the drain and the source, and allows us to draw the P plus mask to include. The gate of the MOSFET while not realizing a P plus area under the gate of the MOSFET. It's important to notice this because this will only happen if you form the gates of the transistors first and then implant the sources and the brains. And so um, we form P plus areas and then we remove the P plus mask and apply the N plus mask and then also implant the N plus areas and thus we have created sources and drains and contacts in, in, in all locations we want. Now it's important to understand why we created the gates first and then implanted the sources and the drains and this is called the self-aligned process. If we had created the sources and the drains first and then the transistor gates because that's the general you know philosophy behind the design flow is to go from lower layers to higher layers. But if we had done this, we would create the source and the drain, and then we would go to create the uh, MOSFET gate. There's an inevitable uh, mismatch or misalignment between the masks of different layers. We will do our best to minimize this misalignment, but a misalignment of zero can never be assumed. On the other hand, any kind of misalignment between the transistor gate and the source and the drain will lead to the transistor gate not covering the entire channel, which would lead to loss of electrostatic control over the channel, which can also lead to loss of transistor action altogether. But on the other hand, if you create the MOSFET gate first, the polysilicon gate first, and then you implant the sources and the drains using the polysilicon gate as a barrier to prevent implantation of ions below the, uh, the, the oxide, below the thin oxide, then even if there is a slight 
mismatch between uh, the two masks, we will still create a transistor. All that would happen is that we would create a drain, for example, that is slightly wider and a source that is slightly shorter. In fact, even with a lot of mismatch, we still have a transistor. It's not a problem-free transistor, it's one which has more resistance than, than planned for, for example, in the source in this case, but it is still a transistor. So this is a self-aligned process and it is um, inevitable and very useful. Uh, but there's one thing about the self-aligned process. It assumes that we will make the source and the drain after the gate. So what this means is recall that when we use ion implantation to form the source and the drain, we have to anneal the, the, the wafer afterwards. So we have to do annealing. And so that means that after we do this, we heat the wafer to a very high temperature, actually near the melting point of silicon, which means that if the gate had been made of metal, for example, then what would happen? What would happen is after we implant the source and the drain and we start to anneal the wafer, the temperature needed for annealing would melt all the transistor gates. So why do we have to make the transistor gates first? Because otherwise we have a non-self-aligned process like the situation here and we have uh, a very high sensitivity to misalignment, which is why we have to create MOSFET gates using polysilicon.